Welcome. Welcome to the ninth Lynn W. Day Distinguished Lectureship in Forest and Conservation History, sponsored by the Forest History Society, the Duke University Department of History, and the Nicholas School of the Environment. Now, we generally have scheduled this lecture during the second week in November, and periodically it falls on Veterans Day. So we thank you if you've given up part of your holiday to be here. But this is a day to honor all the men and women who have served in America's armed forces and to thank them for defending the freedom that we so dearly enjoy. We, rem we remember these heroes for their valor, their loyalty, and their inspiration. And we also remember and honor those who laid down their lives in freedom's defense and made, that and made that sacrifice for our benefit. The Distinguished Lectureship seeks to recognize a scholar or leader in natural resources that is shaping our understanding of human history and environmental change. In addition to being serious scholarship, the lectureships aim to be accessible to a broad audience on unique and provocative topics and philosophies. They all consider elements of the moral challenge of living sustainably on the earth. Information about the previous lectures given by noted environmental historians, such as uh, William Cronin, Stephen Pine, John McNeil, David Foster, Donald Worcester, Patricia Limerick, Char Miller, and Jenny Price can be found on the Forest History Society's website at www.foresthistory. Org. Now, on that website, you can also find the Forest History Society's new blog. This is fun, called Peeling Back the Bark. And we invite you to, to find that, try it out, and leave some comments uh, as well. Uh, on that, that blog, you'll find uh, periodic notices and uh, photos and other materials from the Forest History Society's library and archives. Now, the lectureship was named for Lynn Weyerhaeuser Day, a longtime supporter of the Forest History Society. She was committed to forest conservation, environmental issues, human welfare, and international development. And she firmly believed that the lessons of history can help us ask better questions that will, in turn, lead to better decisions now and in the future. This lecture has been approved for one hour of CFE credit by the Society of American Foresters, and it has been approved for one credit towards the North Carolina Environmental Education Certificate Program. And I'd like to welcome the Triangle Chapter, the Duke Student Chapter, and the North Carolina State Student Chapter of the Society of American Foresters. If you are interested in the CFE credit hours, uh, please see Kelly McCarter over uh, by the, the desk there, wave your hand, uh, following uh, the lecture here and uh, then into the, uh, the reception. And in fact, please join us for the reception. It's in the Duke East Parlors, the next building over. So come out the doors, make a left, and you'll find it. Our speaker today is Dr. Robert Gottlieb, who will be speaking on the next environmentalism after the 2008 election. Dr. Gottlieb is the Henry R. Luce Professor of Urban Environmental Studies and Director of the Urban and Environmental Policy Institute at Occidental College in California. He is the series editor of the MIT Press Series entitled Urban and Industrial Environments and the series Food, Health, and the Environment. He is co-author of 11 books, including Reinventing Los Angeles, published in 2007, Environmentalism Unbound, Exploring New Pathways for Change, published in 2001, and Forcing the Spring, the Transformation of the American Environmental Movement, published in 1993 by Island, Island Press, and then uh, second edition in 2005. He has served on the editorial boards of the journals Environmental History, the Journal Ethics, Place, and the Environment, and the Journal of Hunger and Environmental Nutrition. Prior to his current position, 
Dr. Gottlieb was adjunct professor of environmental policy at UCLA, having previously held positions at the California Institute of the Arts, the People's College of Law, California State University, and the University of Wisconsin. He earned a Bachelor of Arts at Reed College in Portland, Oregon, and has studied at the University of Strasbourg and the New School for Social Research. He will be exploring the historical effect of congressional and presidential elections on the structure and priorities of the environmental movement and taking a look at what we might anticipate in the near future given the results of last week's election. It is our honor to have him with us today. Please help me welcome Dr. Robert Gottlieb. Thank you. I think I zapped your slide. Yeah, we'll see. I, don't know how to get that off. I have no idea. Well, we'll uh, have to. I'll have to. Um, I lost my slideshow. There you go. Go ahead. So I'll I'll uh, start out uh, without a slideshow, and then maybe we'll get a slideshow. You know. Um, First of all, I want to thank Steve, who's uh, uh, Steve Anderson, for his work on, in the society and for this lectureship and uh, substituting for AV purposes right now. Um, <laughs> okay. That didn't work. the transition between administrations that's occurring. <laughs> Actually, I, I'll, um, you almost got it there, that you hit it up there. The, uh, let me just say a, a, a thing about the title of the talk. Um, if you had taken down the notes, you would have seen that it was the next environmentalism, how movements respond to the changes that elections bring, and then the tagline from Nixon to Obama. Uh, so what's interesting, I think, when um, I was uh, pulling together the lecture, and also I saw a couple of the press releases that I think came out of the Nicholas School, <coughs> it said the new environmentalism after the 2008 election. And um, the problem with saying the new environmentalism is that uh, it's uh, very much part of the way we um, tend to forget about uh, the history in which um, changes do occur and set the context for those changes. And that's really what I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about um, environmentalism and the changes that it has gone through in relation to influencing and being influenced by elections. And I wanted to look at it particularly in terms of this contemporary period that goes back to the late 1960s and bring it up to the 2008 election. Um, the other part of the, uh, the talk is from Nixon to Obama, not after the 2008 elections. Well, I saw the after the 2008 elections. Keep in mind that I was preparing this talk before the 2008 elections. I had. Um, only a day or two after the election to make any changes that would go into the talk. So there were a um, couple of things that I thought about in doing that. One is that I anticipated the election of Barack Obama. So I uh, identified the talk in that context. As somebody asked me at the office uh, coming over here, well, what if John McCain had won? Um, so. I ruled out that possibility. So that was one part of the, um, the this, uh, preparing the talk. The other is I did actually think about what I wanted to say, and I prepared it as a kind of a final commentary. So I'm not going to read the paper I prepared, but I will um, read that last moment after the election. and. Um, when I um, pulled together the final comments I wanted to make. So without 
the slideshow, I'll still nevertheless walk you through what I would like to, uh, to talk about. Um, one context for this talk is the work I've done on environmental, on environmental history, particularly the kind of contemporary history of environmental movements. And it um, uh, is, was very much captured in the work I was doing in the, around 1992 uh, or the early 90s, culminating in 1992 when I was writing my book, Forcing the Spring, which was completed before the 1992 election. And for those of you who are not familiar with Forcing the Spring, just uh, by way of context in terms of that book, what I was trying to do was um, uh, look at environmental, uh, the history of the environmental movement um, from the perspective of how different social movements responded to the kind of enormous changes that were taking place going back to the shift towards urbanization that occurred in the late 19th century, early 20th century, the um, industrial changes that were taking place with the Industrial Revolution in the 1860s on into the, uh, into the turn of the century. Now we've got the appropriate person. <laughs> so, don't be distracted. <laughs> I won't be. So, uh, Forcing the Spring really uh, uh, looked at a, a whole set of social movements that up, up to that point had really been um, seen as distinct from environmental history from environmental movements. These were people who were engaged in issues around workplace, and the changes in the workplace, which bred, amongst other social movements, the occupational health movement. These were uh, 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 movements that look oh, that at kind of er the urban form, urban design, the settlement house movement. Um, also looking at um, the those who were advocating around, oh, we got it. So I'll go to Forcing the Spring. <laughs> so now I'm not supposed to wander. See, I actually like to wander when I give a talk, but now I'll stay put. Um, so there were a range of social movements that were really seen as outside of um, the context of environmental history. And I argue that um, environmentalism even if looking at the classic debate between conservationist and preservationist thought, uh, the Muir-Pinchot debates were at the same time also a response to kind of the urban and industrial changes that were taking place that impacted um, urban and non-urban uh, um, um, uh, environments that impacted wilderness um, as well as a built, the built environment. And so I posed it as uh, there were multiple roots of environmentalism, multiple social movements that emerged. And um, just one uh, point about that um, that I uh, got a big kick out of at the time I was writing the book, uh, when I tried to describe the role of Alice Hamilton, whom I characterize uh, this great pioneer around women's uh, health, occupational health, um, looking at the industrial environment, looking at urban issues came out of the settlement house movement. When I talked to my friends in the environmental movement and I said, I'm going to write, I'm writing this book where I want to demonstrate the importance that Alice, Alice Hamilton had that really was the equivalent of the importance of John Muir. Um, my friends would say, who's Alice Hamilton? And when I talked to my friends in the sort of the community health, um, the um, public health world, and I'd say, you know, it's really surprising. I would tell the story. They'd say, who's ha Alice Hamilton? He's as an iconic a figure as John Muir. My friends in those movements would say, who's John Muir? And it really, uh, I think, indicated the way we thought of those movements as distinctive and separate and not equivalent or connected movements. And that was really the argument I was trying to make in Forcing the Spring. So that's just by way of context. Um, 
And then thinking about it in terms of the contemporary history, and particularly in terms of the subject of the talk, um, these social movements have weighed in historically and particularly in, in contemporary context uh, in relation to these kind of political moments, some of which relate directly to elections and outcomes of elections, some of which take place between elections but nevertheless influenced how those um, elections were framed, particularly in terms of environmental questions. And, and when I was doing Forcing the Spring, um, as I said, I was doing it uh, writing, I did the research in the early 90s, I was doing the writing in the summer and fall of 92, and there was, of course, this very important election that was taking place. And what I was also thinking about in terms of that election is that this had come out of 12 years of um, uh, Ray, uh, Ronald Reagan and Bush Sr. that when the election of Ronald Reagan had occurred in 1980, it was uh, kind of the worst fears of uh, many of the environmental groups. And yet, if you think about what happened between 1980 and 1992, and what I was, was in fact looking at, you saw instead a growth of uh, environmental organizations, uh, a way in which environmentalism had not only further entered the main, mainstream, but was seen now as in fact on the ascendant. And I'll talk about that in, in a little bit. Um, so 1992 seemed to be maybe not as momentous a change but yet significant. And when I finished the manuscript, and it was in the copy editing stage, I didn't have a title. Um, and I was very struck by Clinton's inaugural speech, and which this is the opening of that talk, where he used this gardening metaphor of forcing the spring um, as a way to essentially identify that we're not looking behind us, we're looking forward. And we're bringing to birth before its time um, ordinarily would come. Uh, the implication is that we were moving in a way uh, past this bleak history. Uh, we were forgetting about tomorrow, as the Fleetwood Mac song, Clinton's signature song, put it, that um, can't stop thinking about tomorrow and yesterday is gone. Uh, really, it seemed to me symbolized through this gardening metaphor um, how it w that election was perceived, including by um, many of the different parts of the environmental movement. Um, and I would argue, as I um, did in that book, that you can't, you can't really escape that history. Uh, that you, if, uh, you, know, you can't be, uh, as James Joyce put it, um, that history somehow represents a nightmare from which you're trying to awake, but instead put history in the context of what lessons it provided us in shaping what we wanted to do tomorrow, but also to think of the present as history um, that could go back and look at, from the lens that we have today, what those historical events uh, were, had taken place and how they informed as well the way we thought about the, the days to come. So that's really um, the context for this talk. So I'm going to go back to, um, to the late 1960s to start with. Um, and uh, I want to look at, if I could, there we go. I want to look at um, first the period in the late 1960s, the not, not so much the 1968 election, but the period of time in the late 1960s and early 1970s. And uh, because that really provided a way of how in the envir environmental issues emerged anew, um, and actually a new language of environmentalism was, uh, was developed. And, and if you take yourself back to that period, you're, you're looking at some events that appeared momentous, um, that, uh, that suggested a kind of world out of control. Um, the Cuyahoga River, 
in Cleveland that caught fire from the discharges from the steel and chemical plants and burned for three days. Um, the Santa Barbara oil spill, which appeared to um, wreck uh, an economy as well as an environment, and where people were chanting, get oil out, not drill, baby, drill. Um, and it culminated in this event, this Earth Day event in, in 1970, that um, was significant in a number of ways. It appeared to be, it appeared to capture this sense of both uh, the need for transformation and impending doom. The uh, Walter Cronkite special um, that I reference here uh, was really the, t the tenor of the times. Uh, we're, we're faced with this moment where the world can be saved. But this was also the late 1960s, uh, literally uh, just a, a week and a half after Earth Day occurred, uh, the bombing of Cambodia took place and the events at Kent State and Jackson State occurred. We were in the midst of this enormous turmoil um, where there were both a range of new social movements, not just the environmental movement was, which was appearing in its new forms at that time, uh, and, and a political discourse that was um, up for grabs. And so if you look at this period, what, what emerges is, on the one hand, environmentalism as a political strategy. Um, secondly, environmentalism as a new set of social movements as well as a regrouping of some of the traditional organizations um, and, emerge, and some emerging new ones. And then finally looking at it in terms of, particularly when we pass into this early to the mid 1970s, a shift from simply identifying uh, the problems of the environment to how solutions can be made, particularly in relation to governance questions. So after Earth Day, you see this shift beginning to occur in terms of political change, political strategy, new social movements, um, and uh, a shift around the question of how laws were being developed and implemented. Um, first is, uh, the first thing to keep in mind from 1970 to 1972, as environmentalism emerged, um, you had um, a, a, a real significance in relation to the 1972 election. The leading Democratic candidate was Edmund Muskie, who wore his environmental hat, who had been um, a major player, actually had also been criticized by people like Ralph Nader for his role in an earlier period, in the uh, passage of the uh, Air Quality Act in 1967. Muskie shifted gears, put the environment forward as his major issue, and um, caused some panic in the White House. Really, some of the origins of Watergate and the dirty tricks that uh, developed in the period from 1970 to 72 initially had its focus as Muskie is the strongest challenger, let's put him out of commission and find what we consider to be our weakest challenger for that election. And, and, um, but at the same time, address this environmental question. And Nixon's strategy uh, was, in effect, to depoliticize the issue, uh, which some, uh, some of those who were embracing the environmental uh, uh, agenda wanted to, in fact, define it as an apolitical agenda. Uh, and many of Nick Nixon's speeches from 1970 to 1972 talked about the environment as separated from politics, above politics. Um, but many in the environmental movement didn't buy that, um, or different groups that emerged in this period. And one of the um, ways in which the environmental movement emerged in the context of these elections were a series of campaigns that targeted members of Congress who were seen as um, either the biggest obstacles for environmental change, Wayne Aspinall, um, and um, in his role as the chair of the um, Natural Resources Committee in Congress, um, George Fallon, who 
uh, played the most significant role around air quality um, legislation, et cetera. And so they targeted, they created uh, campaigns that identified the environment as a political issue um, and were largely successful. The Dirty Dozen campaign of 72, which came out of the first couple of races in 70, was largely successful and uh, changed the image of environmentalism as more action and politically oriented. And uh, that corresponded with what kinds of groups were emerging in this period. Um, some of the kind of largest uh, organizations today, like the Natural Resources Defense Council or the Environmental Defense Fund, had their origins in this period. Um, EDF, for example, which some consider the most uh, kind of conservative, uh, market-oriented of the large um, um, mainstream professional organizations, had as its slogan when it was formed by its leading at one of its leading advocates, sue the bastards. Um, it was a, uh, uh, a politics of confrontation and mobilization. NRDC saw itself as a law firm for the environment. Uh, even groups like the Sierra Club and Audubon and the uh, um, uh, the uh, National Wildlife Federation began to see the need to shift their own agendas or at least to capture some of this new energy that was, that was identifying the problems of urban and industrial life as key to their own agenda, whether it was air quality, water quality, um, uh, transportation, et cetera. And there were at the same time uh, kind of a militant surge of local groups like the Get Oil Out folks in Santa Barbara, uh, the Stamp Out Smog in Pittsburgh, um, local groups that took issues that were po powerful representations of, um, of the environment in their communities and emerged to, um, um, to give battle around either kind of the problems of local policy or local um, industries that were significant targets in terms of their environmental impacts. You also had um, a level of direct action that you had really not seen uh, um, um, for, uh, for decades and decades. Um, um, the groups like Greenpeace really got their start in this period um, dealing with issues of the ocean environment. Uh, the anti-nuclear activists of the early and mid-1970s used the tactics uh, of direct action to really reshape the discourse around particular kinds of environmental questions. So by the end of the uh, period, the Nixon-Ford period to 1976, uh, it appeared in that period that environment, this, this kind of new environmentalism, which called itself environmentalism, uh, a new term that had been um, really not used uh, in a, a predominant way prior to the late 1960s, that this new environmentalism had reached the point where it could literally enter the corridors of power. And if you look at the Carter years, uh, you see some kind of second level appointments in key agencies dealing with the environment of people, kind of a revolving door between the large, particularly the large professional environmental groups and um, people at the, say, deputy secretary and assistant secretary level. Um, you also saw initiatives that were designed uh, as uh, sort of combining uh, efficiency arguments, which was Carter's uh, mantra, with environmental uh, opportunities, uh, such as the Water Project Hit List, which was Carter's first really major in uh, initiative, the idea that um, there, were, there were either going to be reconstruction of these water projects or um, uh, no longer funding water projects that um, um, were, had problems in terms of their economic return as well as their environmental consequence. Um, but what was interesting is that the environmental groups, as they entered the corridors of power, forgot about the opportunity of of further changing the discourse and also reaching out to new constituencies. So the 76 election, in a way, put the environmental movement to sleep. 
the water project hit list out in the west, particularly some parts of the south, um, generated fierce opposition, led to um, kind of new land use movements, the, the Sagebrush Rebellion, which I'll talk about in a second. And um, uh, environmental groups failed to expand the territory of the environmental agenda and failed to really develop a, um, new kinds of alliances that were really critical and building the change in policy from the ground up rather than thinking of the ability to um, enter the corridors of power meant in fact that you were now able to accomplish what you needed to accomplish. One final thing, um, environmental groups didn't really know how to uh, address the fact that on the one hand the Carter administration appeared to be putting forth some environmental programs even in the area of energy but it, and, and talking about conservation for example which was really the context of the moral equivalent of war speech that Carter gave uh, the, or the chat he gave wearing his cardigan sweater. Um, but they were also uh, uh, disappointed because Carter would instead tout technologies like oil shale which were enormously destructive to the environment as part of his overall um, approach to, uh, to energy policy. So they were really unprepared for what took place in 1980. And uh, in 1980, you had, as I said before, environmentalists' worst fears appear to um, come to pass. This was uh, uh, Ronald Reagan standing up in, in the election saying, I am a sagebrush rebel. And some of the quotes I had earlier uh, were uh, designed, in fact, to, um, to rankle environmentalists because Reagan felt that he was able to marginalize the environmental argument because of that disconnect between argument and constituency building and alliance development. So the, if you look at the 1980 election, what you do see as well in terms of this kind of marginalization that was taking place is thinking about the Green Party. You might not re remember, but 1980, one of the candidates, there were four, actually four candidates, one of them was Barry Commoner, who ran on the presidential ticket um, as the Green Party candidate for president, where environment stood front and center in terms of the agenda that he was uh, putting forth. He was, in fact, anticipating the concept of the green economy which we'll hear about in, in, a, in, in a little bit. But Commoner um, suffered the fate of all third parties in the United States, the absence of any kind of third party tradition, the, the, the way in which the environmental questions were marginalized uh, really uh, just underlined the fact that there was not going to be a Green Party emerging in the United States the way they were already beginning to emerge in Europe and changing the way uh, the political framework of decisions around the environment were taking place in those countries in Europe. So what about Ronald Reagan? Um, worst nightmare, worst fears, whether it was uh, talking about um, oil and energy exploration, uh, whether it was talking about water policy uh, in 1982, I was, uh, at that point, uh, in my uh, multiple hats that I've worn over, over my uh, career lifetime, I was a, a board member of the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, uh, one of 51 members of the board, and typically outvoted 50 against one um, on questions that came up about the environment. And I remember going to this meeting in Salt Lake City, where James Watt was the keynote speaker. And he, uh, here were people from agriculture and mining and urban uh, water districts who really had, uh, were at the cutting edge of new development and hostile to any kind of environmental argument. And, um, and Watt was saying, you know, we, we will bring the change, his terms for bringing the change. But what in fact happened is he didn't bring about the change. Uh, for a number of reasons, the Reagan administration 
really didn't want to change some of the dynamics of environmental policy. And in the areas where they did want to change those policies, uh, they faced a hostile Congress. And the environmental groups really shifted their attention from um, presidential politics to congressional politics during the early and mid-1980s, and were able and, uh, to successfully beat back some of the initiatives that the Reagan administration uh, wanted to bring about. Uh, and where they couldn't, where there were administrative changes, where there were policies that were implemented which did not require congressional approval, the environmental groups, particularly the large pr professional-based and the mainstream groups, were able to use that as a fundraising opportunity. James Watt was the poster boy for mass mailings that brought hundreds of thousands of new members to groups like NRDC and the Sierra Club. Um, but uh, what you basically had was uh, a continuation of the status quo. And so by the time Reagan was replaced by Bush Sr., you had Bush Sr. successfully posing his own agenda as an environmental agenda and um, uh, being able to put Michael Dukakis as a Democratic opponent on the defensive, talking about the pollution in Boston Harbor, for example. Um, and environmental groups, by and large, supported Dukakis, but felt a level of comfort in the, uh, uh, in the comparison between George Bush Sr. and Ronald Reagan, partly because, amongst other things, his appointments in key environmental positions tended to reinstitute a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit of that revolving door. Uh, most notably, William Ruckelshaus, um, who was the president of the Conservation Foundation prior to his appointment as EPA administrator, and who was part of what uh, uh, these large groups called themselves this, the, the group of 10, the largest of the environmental groups in the wake of the Reagan election, felt um, that they, they, they had this kind of enormous moment of desperation with Ronald Reagan. By the time 1990 comes, or 1988, 1990 comes around, it's one of the group of 10 who's now EPA administrator. Um, I don't want to understate some of the uh, destructive things the Bush administration did in terms of environmental policy, and there were a number of those changes as well. But the mood in the environmental group was satisfied uh, amongst many of the environmental groups, at least amongst that wing of environmentalism that I characterized in Forcing the Spring as a kind of a ma uh, the mainstream professional-based organizations. Um, and nothing uh, provided as strong an indication of that satisfaction than Earth Day 1990. 20 years after the first Earth Day, this was a, an event that everybody, from Standard Oil uh, to George H.W. Bush to Greenpeace, participated in. Um, uh, the Nixon desire to depoliticize the movement hadn't succeeded except to the extent that by 1990 you now had everybody embracing the environment. But not quite everybody. What you also saw in the early and uh, mid-1980s was a kind of re-emergence uh, of groups that were like the 1970s local groups or the earlier manifestation of groups that were responding to the kinds of changes in neighborhoods and workplaces, you had what we today call the environmental justice movement emerged. And in the early and mid-1980s, these movements focused not so much on the policy process from above, but creating a politics from below, b creating a politics that was um, based on the ways in which environment was experienced in daily life. And uh, in 1991, uh, a signal event took place in the development of these environmental justice groups uh, called the People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit. And uh, that gathering, which Dana Alston 
was a keynoter and gave her famous talk where she talked about environment is where we live, work, and play, uh, really signaled a new kind of environmental politics that was based in community, that was uh, uh, implacable in opposition to some of the kinds of environmental um, uh, problems that those communities were experiencing, um, and not directly wanting to enter the political sphere the, and the electoral sphere uh, that, the ways that the mainstream groups had done. So that's the setting that brings us to 1992. In 1992, um, you had a, uh, an election of a president, and particularly a vice president, who the environmental groups felt was one of their own. Uh, if you recall, Gore published Earth in the Balance in 1988. Uh, in the 1992 election, however, um, Gore really sought to downplay some of the more kind of visionary statements he had. It was his, his um, uh, early warnings about global warming um, that you could find in that book. Uh, but nevertheless, there was this sense that 1992 was, uh, uh, as the Fleetwood Mac song put it, a way to can't stop thinking about tomorrow. What is tomorrow going to bring? Well, one of the first things that um, tomorrow was going to bring was the carbon tax, an idea that Gore floated. It uh, entered Congress and was shot down immediately. It was dead on arrival. Um, there would be no carbon tax. There would be no, ultimately, um, policy that looked systemically both at energy issues uh, specifically and climate change issues um, in a broader context. The first set of issues where environmentalists weighed in was NAFTA, uh, the North American Free Trade Agreement, uh, where uh, there had been prior to the 92 election some environmental opposition, concern about uh, the undermining of uh, environmental uh, regulations in the U.S. and the uh, companies escaping to the Mexican side of the border uh, to avoid environmental regulations. So there was a debate with, both within the environmental movement and in the Clinton administration, they put forth the argument that if you had a labor side agreement and an environmental side agreement, you would take care of, of business. Well, the environmental groups were split. You had NRDC and EDF on one side saying the side agreements were sufficient. You had Greenpeace and the Sierra Club saying they were not sufficient. And you had the environmental Jews justice group saying, what we really have to do is start talking to our compadres south of the border and create a link politics. Uh, um, that NAFTA is um, the symbol of the problem of uh, the absence of those kinds of connections. And the environmental ju justice groups uh, saw a payoff. Um, they had, uh, for the first time, a, a set of policies that were identified um, that uh, stated in a kind of an environmental justice context. It was sort of Executive Order 12898 was like the NEPA for the environmental justice movement, saying that from now on you had to look at the, this question of uh, disparities in any kind of uh, policy from the federal government. Well, what happened? Um, what happened, in fact, is that uh, similar, similarly to the late 1970s, the early 1990s, um, at least at the level of pre presidential and congressional politics, really uh, was ineffective in terms of, of mobilizing. Um, and things like the carbon tax and the health policy that, uh, Nick, uh, that uh, Clinton brought forth um, created a counterpart, counterpoint in the form of um, the Republican resurgence in the 94 elections. And although the contract with America, contract on America, by the way, was the NRDC phrase for the contract with, with America, the contract with America was, uh, uh, didn't have a, in its 10 planks an environmental um, set of arguments directly, but indirectly it was all about the environment because it was about land use, it was about development, it was about 
uh, property rights, uh, very much uh, cutting to the chase some of the, uh, the concerns, whether it's the endangered, anything from the Endangered Species Act to municipal and um, state policies that dealt with environmental resources. So the late 90s were an interesting period. The environmental groups tried to reestablish their place. Um, and this was particularly true, I would argue, with the environmental justice groups, who took their argument about environment being where we live, work, and play, and put that in the context of now, what are the issues in our neighborhoods where we can shift from the ways in which the environment negatively impacts our communities to an agenda for change um, without uh, using the Barack Obama phrase in, in the late 1990s, it, change we can believe in. That was, in fact, the, the beginnings of the new environmental justice agenda. Let's look at issues like food. Let's look at issues like transportation. Let's look at issues like housing. These are all part of where we live, work, and play. We need to come up with a, an argument um, that says these are the ways we can change our communities. And Barrio Logan, uh, a inner city ghetto in San Diego, became a target of one of the most dynamic uh, and successful of the environmental justice groups, the Environmental Health Coalition, that made that transition and got very engaged in, at the same time in local politics in order to make the transition to a land use policy, a neighborhood-based policy, using Barrio Logan as their first cut at uh, what I would call a kind of place-based environmentalism. So now we come to the last eight years. Um, the election of Bush and Cheney was interesting for a number of reasons um, in, uh, in 2000 itself. Um, on the one hand, the environmental groups felt Al Gore. You know, he didn't, after the carbon tax disappeared, he didn't necessarily put environment front and center is in his role as vice president, but we know the true Al Gore. And interestingly, environment did not factor in as a core set of issues in the 2000 election. Um, Gore did not raise that as his signature um, um, strategy. And the environmental groups, the mainstream groups in particular, uh, took a kind of a secondary role in that election. At the same time, similar to 1980, we had another candidate who was really an iconic figure in terms of environmental history, and that was Ralph Nader. But similar to 1980, Ralph Nader's presence um, really only accomplished the fact that the outcome of the 2000 election was a four to three vote uh, in the Supreme Court uh, that put George Bush in, and Dick Cheney into office. So we got George Bush. And even more than the fears generated by Ronald Reagan, we had put into practice some of the, uh, the harshest, uh, strongest anti-environmental um, legislation um, of the last 30, and, and environment, particularly environmental regulations and administrative actions of, the la of this last 30, 35 year period. I mean, you can go through it. The, the mantra of, of anti-environmental uh, discourse that Bush promoted and Cheney particularly promoted um, was uh, uh, really uh, so powerful that the environmental groups finally recognized the need uh, to mobilize in a way that they hadn't really mobilized since the early 1970s. The problem with the 2004 mobilization of environmental groups was that it, w it really was separate from, it was like there were all these different players, the labor movement, the environmental groups, um, the, um, the 527s that were organized, were mobilizing as kind of distinct players. Um, there wasn't a coherent agenda that was being established. There really wasn't organizing the way we, uh, we saw it take place in the 2008 election. Um, environmental groups were out in the hustings, but they weren't really connected to the communities in which they were organizing, 
for one, nor were those organizers out in the field considering themselves anything but uh, people who wanted to take George Bush out of office. Um, that was really the nature of the 2004 election. And that finally brings us to where we are today. Uh, and the 2008 election, as I was preparing this talk, as I said, um, seemed to me to signify some uh, really uh, powerful moments in terms of assuming like the late 1960s and early 1970s witnessed um, the opportunities for what I'm characterizing as the next environmentalism. And um, let me read you what I wrote two, uh, a few days ago. And um, that's after the 2008 election, if you will. So I wrote, the election of Barack Obama suggests multiple lessons for what I'm calling the next environmentalism. The embrace and elevation of community organizing as the model for outreach and change suggests one crucial direction. Reinforcing the notion that environmentalism and any other social movement is strongest when it is rooted in communities. The embrace and elevation of a green economy associated with but not limited to the focus on climate change provides an opening to develop an alternative vision of the kinds of changes we need in how we organize our economic systems. To develop, as one example, what Michael Pollan has called a solar-based food system, which entails a transformative view of how, what, and where food should be grown, produced, and consumed. And third, the extraordinary financial meltdown and global economic crisis also affords for environmentalists and for all other social movements an entree into such issues as global equity and a renewed public role, a true sharing of the wealth, where wealth can also be defined in green or socially and environmentally appropriate terms. An Obama presidency also offers cautionary lessons for environmentalists based on earlier lessons stemming from prior elections and changes in administration. It is imperative that environmentalists not define success as simply the ability of an interest group to secure a seat at the table, but rather as an opportunity to change the discourse and the framework for policy. It is also crucial for environmentalists, particularly environmental justice advocates, to recognize that the environmental justice perspective, as environmental justice leader Penny Newman has put it, provides one entry point in the larger quest to envision a more socially just, democratic, and livable community and global order. Pulling together this talk in the midst of such a fierce election where organizing and mobilization were so prominent and where the rhetoric of change placed the burden and opportunities for change on the organizers and not just the candidate, reminded me of the moment in early 1993 when another change was about to occur, while I was also trying to make sense of environmentalism's past and the hope for the future. I thought about the Fleetwood Mac song that Clinton had embraced as the symbol of his notion of hope, a song in a campaign that was as much about leaving behind the past as identifying the future. As I watched the election results come in last week, actually, if you look, if you heard the song in the background of his speech in Grant Park, I began to think about the Obama campaign's signature song, Bruce Springsteen's The Rising. Written in the wake of 9-11, Springsteen's song is about hope and renewal, where there is not just an escape from the past, but coming to understand its lessons as part of the renewal itself. A dream of life, the chorus sings. And as we sort out this election and the new and challenging era we are about to encounter, we can envision this moment where hope and renewal may also come to mean reinvention and transformation.